Okay, thanks, Jenny. All right, excellent. So we have a small but mighty group here today. So I hope everyone is ready to participate. Uh, I'm gonna leave my camera on for a minute and then like Sam, I'm gonna turn mine off. Um, so uh, today uh, I'm here to uh, give this research and applications webinar what we talk about when we talk about algorithms. Um, and so I wanna give you a little introduction about who I am. Um, and then find out a little bit about who you are, although I may already know because of um, the folks who are here. Um, so I'm Jenny Dale, I use she, her pronouns. And as Sam said, I'm the Information Literacy Coordinator at UNCG Libraries. I'm also the liaison to five different departments on campus, classical studies, communication studies, English, media studies, and women's gender and sexuality studies. So if you could take a moment and just share your department or program or the office that you work in on campus in the chat. Like I said, I think I might know, um, but uh, it's on the screen, so I have to say it. So if you could just share in the chat. Um, there's Sam, excellent, excellent liaison librarian and online learning librarian. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off. Mark, okay, I knew your name was familiar, Mark. I feel like you have worked with, you worked with Linda Kellum some when she was here. Um, so ITS, Research Application Support. And then um, I know Ben is uh, from the UTLC and also, there we go, also teaches in political science, awesome. All right, I'm gonna turn my um, camera off at this point just because uh, I always prefer the recordings to just be off the slides. Um, so before I go any further, I do wanna give you a, a sort of caveat of who I'm not. Um, I am not a computer scientist or a programmer or coder. I'm not a mathematician or a sociologist, although, all of these sort of fields and areas come into play when we talk about algorithms. Um, I just want to be very clear. I am an information literacy librarian, and that's the approach um, that I take when I think about algorithms and these kinds of platforms. Um, so what are algorithms? So I'm going to actually ask you again to use the chat. Don't worry, you won't have to do this all throughout the presentation. But um, for now, I want to hear from you in the chat. Um, or you can unmute yourself. Again, we've got a pretty nice, uh, uh, cozy crowd this morning. So if you want to unmute yourself, that's also fine. I just want to hear when you hear this word algorithm, what does it mean to you? What's your understanding or definition of it? And I'll give you a moment there to either again uh, unmute. Oh, it looks like Ben's unmuted. Excellent. Yeah, it's uh, I'm on a tablet, so it's easier to talk than to type. Um, so for me, it's it's sort of like a um, a way of systematizing inputs uh, and uh, using computing technology to uh, standardize outputs that come out of those inputs that are coming in. Okay, yeah, awesome. So I think three things that you said there that are really important are inputs, outputs, um, and that systematization. Systematization, I don't, maybe, the systematizing that happens, I'll go with that, um, sort of in between the inputs and the outputs. Um, and Sam in the chat put in things that happen on the back end in search engines, that's definitely uh, a type of algorithm. Um, I'll give you all another uh, little bit here just to see if there are any other definitions that come up, but I think we've got some good sort of ideas to work with so far. And it looks like we might have a new participant. This is very exciting. Okay, so welcome to our new participant. I'm Jenny um, and I am talking about algorithms. Okay, so here we go, let's go on. I'm gonna give you, because I'm a librarian, I'm gonna give you the official Oxford English Dictionary definition. This is my favorite dictionary. It's sort of a comprehensive dictionary of the English language. Um, and they define um, algorithms as being um, in the fields of mathematics and computing, a procedure or set of rules used in calculation and problem solving, or in later use specifically, a precisely defined set of mathematical or logical operations for the performance of a particular task. So this, you can definitely see that sort of systematization, I still may be pronouncing that wrong, um, that, that Ben mentioned. Um, these sort of inputs and outputs and then the sort of the, the systems in between them. Um, where do we encounter algorithms in our life? So Sam already mentioned search engines in the chat, and that's one of the places I think we sort of encounter these most often in our sort of daily life. Um, we also, we encounter algorithms quite a bit with 
Um, with social media, we also, algorithms are also at work in kind of a different way when we might seek health, social, or financial services, like if we want to apply for, um, you know, a social service, if we want to apply for a credit card, we want to apply for a mortgage, things like that. And then also when we apply for things like jobs or for educational opportunities. Um, I'm curious to, to hear again um, from y'all in the chat, if you'd like, where are there other places that you can think of that you feel like we encounter algorithms a lot as sort of part of our day-to-day -day engagement with the world? And if so, you can put those in the chat. Um, but I will go ahead and go on because of our time. So I, I argue that in an increasingly networked society, algorithms impact the way we see and experience the world in a lot of different ways, but also the way that the world sees us and makes decisions about us, um, but we really can't see them. And so a lot of algorithms um, that we are gonna come into contact with in our day-to-day uh, -day life are gonna be sort of a black box technology, meaning that, like Ben said, there's an input and then there's kind of this black box, this proprietary algorithmic technology that we can't see, that we don't know how it works because it sort of you know, belongs to the corporations um, or the corporate entities that own it. And then there are outputs on the other side. So if we're talking about search engines, right? It's our search terms. And then there's this black box and then there's our search results. If we're talking about you know, applying for a credit card, it's our application black box, then whether or not our application gets accepted or rejected. Um, so algorithms are having a, a really um, significant impact on us, um, but we often, there's not enough transparency for us to necessarily understand how they're working behind the scenes. So as I mentioned, you know, I'm an information literacy librarian and that's how I'm approaching this topic. So I just want to give you this brief definition of information literacy, which is the one I typically use. Um, it's from the Association of College and Research Libraries in 2016. And by the way, I am um, at the end gonna give you the link to my slides, which has lots of um, links and resources included within. So I will share that right at the end of the presentation. Um, but this definition is information literacy is the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. Um, so I see algorithms in all kinds of spaces here, right? I definitely see them in terms of where we discover information. The way that we discover information is heavily impacted by that. Um, the way that information gets valued and then the way that we might need to use algorithms or rely on algorithms as we create and share new knowledge. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about a, a report that came out in January of 2020 from um, an organization called Project Information Literacy, called Information Literacy in the Age of Algorithms. But I wanted, before I kind of go into the, the findings of that study, to, to really quote from this sort of what I see as kind of a call to action in that report. So if we believe that information literacy educates students for life as free human beings who have the capacity to influence the world, then information literacy needs to incorporate an understanding of ways that news and information flows are shaped by algorithms. To do this, we need to know more about how students interact with algorithm-driven platforms. We must consider courses of action for educators preparing students to understand the technological and social forces shaping the circulation of news and information in society today. So I agree with this, and that's kind of why I included this sort of lengthy quote here. I think this, um, I think, you know, for, for us, even if we aren't actively teaching courses, we are educators. We at UNCG um, are all about educating our students and working together to do so. So um, that's going to be kind of my focus today. Um, and I want to go through some of the findings from that report I mentioned, Information Literacy in the Age of Algorithms. Um, so this was a report, like I said, it was released in January 2020, um, and it reports uh, data that was collected in fall 2019. So certainly before the, the current situation that we find ourselves in, um, which, which could potentially have made a difference, I think, in some of these results. Um, but they did focus groups with, um, there's 16 focus groups with 103 college students at eight universities and colleges in the United States. Um, and then they also interviewed 37 faculty members from those same institutions. 
Um, and I just want to pull up, this is like some of the supporting information. I know you can't see it well, but I'll uh, try to. Uh, this is a visualization sort of accompanies it. Um, and it this visualization comes um, goes with, so here's my, here's a good illustration of these sort of black box technology I was trying to describe there. Um, this visualization is, um, it brings up a lot of the concerns that students raised and faculty raised during this um, study, during the data collection for this study. And I also find visual hand-drawn visualizations to be delightful personally. So um, that's why I have that linked here. All right, I'm going to go into it. So one of the big sections of this report is data analysis, qualitative data analysis um, about student perceptions and concerns. And the report lists four main takeaways in that section. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly here. So takeaway one was that students have an ambivalent bond with algorithm driven platforms. They're aware of them. Um, but, but they have sort of different and ambivalent feelings about them. So some of the themes um, in this, in the qualitative data included this sort of balance of resignation and indignation, the sort of questions of convenience versus privacy, and then issues of desensitization. There's students reporting like, well, I just do this because this is how I do things and I don't really think about it that much anymore. Um, and I wanted to pull out this, uh, quote that really fascinated me. Um, as one student described a sense of resignation combined with indignation, it's a horrible totalitarian hellscape, but it's kind of the best we can reasonably expect. Just a, a little bit uh, cynical, a little bit skeptical, um, which also comes up later. So I wanted to, to bring that in. But I also wanted to showcase this table from the report, which shows their sort of top eight worries about computer algorithms, um, the students who were in these focus groups. And they have the, the top four, two are um, listed as sort of or, or tied kind of as personal concerns and two are societal concerns. The most important one that most people shared was uh, platforms listening across devices or platforms. And there's some quotes from the qualitative data um, that focus on the sort of creepiness of algorithms, things that students find sort of creepy um, about algorithms following them around and keeping their data. Um, the second was that algorithms and automated decision making um, might reinforce inequalities. Um, and that's been the focus of sort of my research on this. Um, the third is that platforms might shape the individual content and ads they see. And then the fourth, that online users are not seeing the same reality. And this is something that we have probably all sort of come into contact with, um, even if we weren't necessarily thinking about it. Uh, like if, you know, we had a big presidential election last week. If I do some searching now um, about the presidential election, I'm going to have, uh, you know, the sites suggested to me are going to be the sites that I've already been looking at. It's going to be based on my sort of personalization and preferences according to these um, algorithm driven um, news searches or, you know, social media searches. Second takeaway. Um, Students use defensive practices to protect their privacy. I thought this was really interesting because one narrative I hear a lot about students, um, especially sort of traditional age college students right now, that sort of Gen Z, um, is that they don't care about their data and they're comfortable like giving up privacy for the sake of convenience or for the sake of personalization. Um, and I, I like that this is counter to that narrative. So students use some traditional sort of um, approaches like ad blockers on their browsers, clearing cookies and caches. Um, and some use VPNs to connect to the internet to try to have a safer browsing experience. Some used uh, browsers like DuckDuckGo, which are not meant to kind of keep um, track of your data. But one thing I thought was really interesting is that um, some of the students sort of reported that they so they, they create these different online selves. So for example, if, um, if you have someone who's really interested in um, cooking and also really interested in comic books, they might create an Instagram account that where they, they show their sort of cooking or they, they show pictures of food they like. And they might create a totally different Instagram account where they sort of declare their love for comic books. And they're doing that, um, according to the study, some of the students here are doing that to, um, to separate sort of their online identities to create these different selves. They were also pretty savvy about protecting their privacy 
with things they would see as maybe like commercial interests, like search engines and social media, but didn't realize that instructional technology like Canvas or other LMS systems that we that we use that are really required for student use might also be tracking, aggregating, and even selling that information. And I thought this was interesting that some students also actively sought to break their own filter bubbles, especially with news sources. So for example, a student might report that they uh, look at a news item on CNN, and then they go and look at a similar news item um, on Breitbart to see how things are being sort of portrayed in different ways. Takeaway three, pretty depressing here. Trust is dead for students and skepticism lives. Uh, choice was a big theme here. Um, talking about having too much choice, like there's just too many different um, sources of information but also that they didn't want algorithmic intervention to reduce their personal choice as they were seeking out information. Um, and another theme that, that arose is that no news source could be trusted at face value. And unfortunately, this um, reflects what we see from, from research on other age groups. Uh, lots of research has been done recently or in recent years by like the Pew Internet Research Project and the Knight Foundation that show a real erosion of trust in, in news media sources. And then that fourth takeaway is that even though the students and faculty in this study were, were really concerned and interested in talking about the ways that algorithms do shape um, how, we, how we engage with the world, this really didn't come up much in their classes. So instead, many students like amateur sleuths had discovered algorithms through keen observation, noticing how their content was personalized and different from what their friends were seeing. And there were some students who were concerned uh, about the rest of us, about the, us older generations. And they were worried that, um, uh, and there's an example in there of a student talking about their grandfather and their grandfather saying that Facebook is was addictive and they were trying to explain to their grandfather how that's a bad thing, it's built that way and you've gotta be careful. All right, so they also in this study have a section on recommendations for key stakeholders. Um, and those stakeholders include educators at all levels. Um, they include uh, librarians like me and like Sam. Um, they include uh, the news media, they include journalists, which I thought was interesting. And I think so ultimately, I think we can kind of all find ourselves in these groups of key stakeholders. So they suggest using peer-to-peer -peer learning to nurture personal agency and advance campus-wide learning. Um, and I'm going to talk about that more in a moment here. Um, the K-20 student learning experience must be interdisciplinary, holistic, and integrated. News outlets must expand their algorithmic algorithm coverage, which I actually think is being done pretty well. But the second half, they're not necessarily usually being transparent about their own practices. Um, and then learning about algorithmic justice supports education for democracy. So those are their recommendations and sort of things to take away for our stakeholders. Um, so I'm going to go through um, some of my ideas about bringing algorithms into the classroom. And again, this could be a traditional classroom, like a semester long class. It could be a workshop that you're that you're doing that learners are engaging in, whether it's sort of a one shot workshop or something else. Um, and because of our timing, I'm not going to have time to go through every all the ideas. I got a little carried away here with my slides. I just get so excited. Um, but I will, again, make these slides available. Um, and I'm also always happy to talk to anyone who's interested in talking about this um, topic and how we might um, bring this into our sort of curriculum or co-curriculum at UNCG. So if you're thinking, one of the things I'll encourage you to think about as I'm giving some examples here is to think about where, um, if you teach uh, like a traditional course, a semester long course, think about where this might fit in terms of meaningful integration. Um, if you teach workshops uh, on, you know, IT topics or uh, information literacy topics like I do, think about where this will fit. But I'm going to go into a couple of different potential approaches. And the first one is one that, in my experience, students um, are really engaged in talking about. And that's a, the approach is problematizing Google. Um, so looking at the search engine landscape, a lot of times when I talk to students about this, they are kind of surprised to think about Google as a um, capitalist entity. A lot of times when we think about something like Google, the first thing we think is it's free. It's free. It's available to everyone. And that's true that it is free for us to use. Um, but when I talk to students about Google, 
um, in a more in-depth way, I like to share this kind of screenshot like I have here, which shows that um, Alphabet Inc., which is the um, company that owns Google, holds 58.6% of the market share of search engines in the United States. Um, and that's already impressive when we think about that being over half. But if you look at the actual amount of money, that's $52.6 billion in 2019 for their, for their revenue. The next sort of um, single named entity there in the sort of yellowish mustard colored block is uh, Microsoft, which owns Bing, which has about 4.5% of the market share or $4 billion. And then the rest are like individual search engines, um, maybe sort of customized search engines, but there it's just sort of everything else is in that 36.9%. Uh, one reading, if you're interested in this topic that I highly recommend is uh, Sophia Moja Noble's uh, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. I have a link here to um, our, we have an ebook version of this in the library. I have a little video of her talking about her work, which is I think really engaging. She's a great speaker and she does really interesting research. Um, but she was particularly interested in looking at questions of sort of intersectionality online. Um, what, it, what is it about search engines? How do they, what messages do they send about, about Black women or Black girls, um, as well as sort of uh, people in like the Latinx population, things like that. So it's a very interesting thing. And, and again, in my experience, students engage well with this kind of content. And one of the things that she brings up in that book um, is that when we think about search results, we really have to think about how powerful they can be in terms of helping students sort of make decisions or help not just students, but anyone uh, make decisions about, um, you know, different things in their lives. And she says they also, they reflect the values and norms of the search company's commercial partners and advertisers and often reflect our lowest and most demeaning beliefs. But the idea is that search engines, um, especially Google, just sort of have this um, give the sense of being objective and their relevancy ranking is based on popularity and that just makes it seem like uh, the problem is not you know the search engine or the algorithm behind it but the fact that people are misogynist or racist um, and that sort of lets lets these algorithms and lets google off the hook a little bit she also says it can be argued that Google functions in the interests of its influen most influential paid advertisers or through an intersection of popular and commercial interests. Yet Google's users often think of it as a public resource. Again, that idea, the first thing you think of when you think of Google is free, it's available to anyone. Um, and so people aren't always thinking of it as um, being something with significant commercial interest. But if we look again, this is from that same report of the search engine industry in the US, um, we see how important capital is when we look at this. So looking at over half of the sort of revenue um, that is brought into a search engine industry is from paid placement of uh, banner ads or other ads things like that. And then the rest is sort of page search, some search engine optimization kind of stuff. Um, and a case study that she talks a bit about in this book, but also got a lot of press a few years ago, um, is the is three Black teenagers. And this is something that you can talk with students about or talk with other people about who are interested in this topic. Um, so in, tw in June 2016, a Twitter user um, took a video showing the difference between searching for three black teenagers and three white teenagers in Google images. And that video went viral and there was a lot of attention in the media thinking about, all right, is this, is Google racist? Do we need to be worried about this? Um, because when you search for three white teenagers, it was mostly sort of stock photography, you know, white teenagers smiling you know, playing sports, that kind of thing. But when you searched for three black teenagers, most of the images were really criminalized. It was a lot of mug shots um, or images from articles about crime. And part of that is because, um, you know, there it's a little bit better now than it was in 2016, but there's not a lot of stock photography of people of color the way there is with white people, this sort of idea that if we're looking for stock photography, um, we're a lot more likely to find uh, white people um, cast in those stock photos than um, people of color. Uh, and so this is an interesting one to talk about, especially because of Google's response. So this is a quote from a Google spokesperson in a BBC article saying basically our image search results just reflect sort of what happens in the way people describe things online. 
This means that sometimes unpleasant portrayals of sensitive subject matter online can affect what image search results appear for a given query. They don't reflect Google's own opinions or beliefs. It, basically, they're passing the buck. It's not our fault. It's humanity's fault, basically, that this is how things came up. Another activity that's kind of along similar lines that you can easily do in a meeting or in a class is just to do ask uh, people to engage on just pull out their phones and do some Google image searching. Um, and so one of the ones I use most often is the fourth example there, unprofessional hair, um, and ask, ask students or ask colleagues or whoever's involved in it to um, kind of reflect on the messages that you get when you search unprofessional hair in almost every um, image is of a woman of color with natural hair or braided hair. Um, so thinking about what kind of messages are being sent and some of these other, um, you know, professions, like professor, for example, or um, sort of derogatory terms like terrorist, we can see some, we start to see patterns. And, and again, in my experience, students get pretty interested in talking about that. Um, using the news, I think, is also a great idea here. Um, one of the things you can do kind of a like inception kind of deal where you talk about Google News as an algorithmic platform that also covers algorithms. Um, and so, for example, I just found a recent article on the algorithm topic page on Google News about um, algorithms blocking kidney transplants to black patients. Um, and that's something that can easily spark some interesting conversations. And I know we're almost out of time, so I am going to just quickly go through um, my other sort of two approach suggestions. Um, but as I promised, I will show these slides and you can see more detail with links. Um, filter bubbles this is a concept that Eli Pariser coined in a TED talk in 2011. The idea that um, algorithmic personalization impacts the way we get particularly news information, but also um, other sort of social media content. Um, and a particularly upsetting um, case study of this is, is looking at Dylan Roof, the um, white supremacist uh, domestic terrorist who uh, was uh, responsible for the Charleston church shooting. There's a really interesting video and some accompanying materials from the Southern Poverty Law Center and teaching tolerance about the role that Google played during his um, sort of radicalization as a white supremacist. Um, so he he talks in some of his own um, writing about how once uh, after um, Trayvon Martin was was killed, he did some research uh, and he started hitting on these sort of dog whistle terms like black on white crime um, that led him into this sort of corner of the internet because of personalization and algorithms that he just kept kind of getting the same kinds of information over and over again. He was in an echo chamber that you know ultimately became really dangerous for for other people um and the the argument is not that that google did this um google that google radicalized him um but all but that it didn't that it did have an impact on the way that he was seeking information and the way he was sort of building his new worldview. um this is fun uh I just learned about this actually through that algorithms report and I'll show you quickly you can go to this resource called their tube which is a um Sort of a simulator so you can say oh i want to know what you know the what google uh youtube's homepage might look like for someone who's a prepper for example um and they sort of simulate what that homepage would look like you can go to the watch history um you can see who they might have watched videos from so it's just kind of putting yourself in a different persona um, and then finally uh automated decision making is something that we don't always talk about as much um we talk about algorithms, particularly again, because we think about them a lot with social media, we think about them with search engines, but they're um, a, a great text if you're interested in this topic is Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks. Um, and in that she's arguing that automated decision making shatters the safety net, uh, criminalizes the poor, intensifies discrimination and compromises our deepest national values. And my favorite way to talk about this is through case studies. Um, so, for example, there was a big study released a little over a year ago that was comparing uh, or analyzing a really commonly used predictive healthcare algorithm, and they found in that that there was pretty significant um, racial disparity in terms of the way that um, Black patients and white patients specifically were treated differently. Um, and Ruha Benjamin, who it has a great book out, uh, another one, I know I keep recommending books, but I'm a librarian, so it's part of, it's part of my world. Um, 
it, her book is called Race After Technology, and, and it's a lot about how sort of technologies have traditionally and continue to um, reinforce uh, oppressive systems that already exist in our societies. Um, but, but her argument here is that, you know, it's not, we can't just blame the algorithm. We can't just say that the algorithm is bad um, or that the person who created the algorithm is bad. We have to look at it in the discriminatory context in which it is sort of, th that, made it, that made it happen in the first place. So she says, if individuals and institutions valued black people more, they would not cost less and thus this tool might work similarly for all. So thinking about just going beyond the, what's happening in the algorithm, um, Compass, which is a correctional offender management profiling for alternative sanctions. I think that's a backronym. I think they were like, we'll call it Compass and then figure out what it means. Um, but there has been uh, there have been some a couple of studies looking at these sort of potential racial bias, but also just the unreliability of this as a an extremely popular and frequently used algorithm driven predictive criminal justice tool. So I'll just wrap up with um, sorry I'm a couple minutes over here um, some some good news I think um, thinking about. Um, empowering conversations that we can have. Hey, Ben, I think you're going to the same meeting that I'm <laughs> heading to next, so I'll see you soon. Thanks for coming. Um, so uh, these are some ideas that I have generally from my own work, but also from that uh, report from Project Information Literacy. Um, I think it's helpful for us to encourage students to imagine solutions to algorithmic bias in search engines. Um, you know, imagining a public search that is not tied to, you know, particular commercial interests, for example. Um, find out how students break their own filter bubbles. Um, we saw in the study that that was happening, and I would love to know more about how students decide to do that. We can advocate for transparency. You know, we will never be able to see the proprietary source code of an algorithm, um, but we can ask companies and we can pressure them to um, tell us you know, what factors are impacting. So for example, um, there was a big uh, controversy last, about a year ago about the Apple credit card um, and a husband and wife applied for it, same income, you know, same everything except for their gender. Um, and he got a significantly higher credit limit than she did. Um, so asking Apple or Goldman Sachs in that case to explain like what's happening behind the scenes that made that disparity the case. And then also encourage students to look at the terms of service agreements they agree to with social media and things like that really carefully, um, but also to seek out information about how their data is being or could be used even by the things that we require them to use, Canvas, Turnitin, Lockdown Browser, things like that. Um, this is, has sort of come more to the forefront during COVID. Um, so that's it. I'm gonna throw my slides link in here. I wanna thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you have questions, um, I'm happy to stay for a couple of minutes before I head to another um, presentation. Um, but I'm also always happy to talk about this through email. So please feel free to email me. I'm going to put my email address in that. And then if you um, go to those slides, my email address is included in there. I also have a very lengthy reference list here in case you are into that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. So I put um, a link to a quick assessment in the chat, as well as um, our upcoming webinars from the library uh, about helping uh, with the transition or continuing to teach online, but also research online, um, whether you're grad students, uh, of course, uh, faculty, staff, uh, anybody is welcome to come if you're interested in those topics. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Um, as well as tell Jenny how she did. Um, so I know Jenny has to go, but um, are there any quick questions for her? Okay, I'm gonna take that silence in that um, this was great. I always enjoy learning more about algorithms. <laughs> yes, it was very interesting. I'm glad you ended on a positive note. It's kind of like a bummer and then you're like, oh. Well. Yeah, yeah. I I, yeah. <laughs> I think we always we always talk about harm when it comes to algorithms. And I think they're, you know, I, I actually found the study that I really dug into there, like 
kind of hopeful in terms yeah. of how students are engaging with this stuff. So. Yeah, mm. students are great. Sorry, my dog is starting to growl. So, um, okay. Well, uh, thanks you all for coming. Uh, please let Jenny or I know if you have any questions. Uh, you will get a link to the recording uh, as well as the slides. Um, so thank you all for coming again. And hopefully we'll see you at some of these winter ones coming up. Thanks, everyone. Bye.